This video is published under the Creative Commons license BYNCSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome to this video in which I would like to introduce my research activities because I think before you listen to one of my lectures on video you possibly would like to know who it is who is talking to you. My name is Andreas Pfennig. I am working at the University of Liège in the Department of Chemical Engineering in the group Products, Environment and Processes and my research activities, the title so to speak, is Extraction, Phase Separation, Process Evaluation and Fundamentals. And if you would like to know something about our research activities in more detail, you can look at the publications at this link, which is spelled out here. Well, uh, before I would like to introduce the individual topics, let me give you a brief overview over my CV. I studied mechanical engineering with a specialization of chemical engineering at RWTH Aachen University in Germany. Then had a stay of one and a half years with John Prausnitz in Berkeley. Then came back to Aachen to do my PhD on uh, development of an equation of state with uh, Hugo Hartmann. Uh, after a brief intermediate uh, stay in uh, Dortmund with Professor Kohler uh, on molecular simulations, I did my habilitation in Darmstadt, also in Germany, with uh, John, uh, Johannes, Johann Gaube on the separation and purification of biomolecules with the help of aqueous two-phase systems. Uh, the habilitation is some bigger thesis, so to speak, that is one way in Germany to become a professor. Then I became professor in Aachen again, on the, in, on the chair of or that institute, if you like, on thermal unit operations. Then in 2011 moved on to um, Graz, University of, Graz University of Technology, and in 2014 moved to Liège, which is my current position in Belgium. After that brief CV, I would like to show you some of the results and some of the approaches we are taking in our research. One topic is solvent and reactive extraction. The idea behind our research actually is to uh, go through the different scales and transfer the knowledge, so to speak, from one scale to the next level. So we investigate molecules, get some idea how they behave, derive models based on, uh, for the next higher level based on the knowledge we have obtained and then step through the different scales until we are able finally to describe the extraction in a real extraction column. So we try to understand the fundamentals of mass and momentum transfer and many other effects that can occur to develop in the end and to scale up new extraction processes. This is again the extraction column where you see now the individual droplets that are rising through this pulsed sieve trays. The pulsation starts in just a moment. You don't see the countercurrent flow of the continuous phase, but it is there, of course. So we have the countercurrent flow of the two phases. And the idea is now to, uh, to really follow the individual drops as they pass along the column and to describe their behavior in all respects mass transfer, sedimentation velocity, breaking and coalescence, possibly also chemical reactions that can go on, in, especially in the case of reactive extraction. And we try to describe that. We try to describe that with a corresponding tool, which we call REDROPS, which stands for representative drops, which means that we are following individual drops as they pass along the column and try to describe their individual behavior, how fast they are, how, mass, how much mass transfer occurs within each time, time step, so we also have a time loop. So in here, for each drop, we really do a simulation of how fast it moves, how much mass is transferred, how, how much reaction occurs, and so on. And then in the time loop, we are, so to speak, taking care of the bookkeeping around that. I don't want to go into the details of all the research that would be, much, be taking much too long at that point. One basis is, of course, that we need to have models that describe all these individual effects for the drops, which are actually, as I said, not so many, sedimentation, mass transfer, breaking and coalescence in the interactions of, between many drops and in the interaction between the drops and the internals of the column. So we need to model that. 
In order to derive such models, we have devised dedicated lab-scale experiments, so small setups with which we, with which we are able to, to measure really how the drops behave. One simple cell is here the sedimentation cell. You, I hope you can see it also on the video. There is a drop rising and the drop is actually being produced with a nozzle which is connected to a computer-driven syringe. So we know the volume of the drop that we have been producing. We see how it rises, evaluate that from a video and that we are able to characterize the sedimentation velocity as a function of drop diameter for a given material system and as a function of intensity of mass transfer, so the mass, so the drop can also undergo mass transfer in this cell. But we, are, we can also evaluate the mass transfer itself in a dedicated uh, lab cell, which is shown here. Again, we produce our drop with a computer-driven syringe and this nozzle. So the drop rises then, detaches from the nozzle and rises. Now in this case we have a counter-current flow of continuous phase and since the diameter of this uh, conical tube changes versus height, we have a higher flow rate of continuous phase here as compared to there. So the drop rises until its sedimentation velocity matches the countercurrent flow velocity and there it's stabilized. We can keep it there for an arbitrary contact time, then sh switch off the flow of the continuous phase. The drop rises, is collected here in this drop collection funnel and is withdrawn again with a computer-driven syringe. We can then analyze after we have collected sufficient fluid, we can analyze the concentration and compare it and evaluate it with this starting concentration which we have of course uh, prepared before. That way we are able to describe and to measure the uh, dimensionless concentration uh, difference, driving concentration difference as a function of contact time and drop diameter. And you see the red points and you see the mesh of an equation of a model that allows to describe that, which in this case has been designed by Martin Henschke, who did the majority of this first work on, on ex design of extraction columns. It has later been proven to work for technical systems by Tobias Kremp Krömping and has been developed further by many other uh, PhD students and co-workers. The result after that looks like that, where you have an extraction column, the individual drops rising, you see the drop size distributions, you see the concentration profiles, these two lines, and if you wait long enough they will move and match with the experimental data, also lots of numerical output. So we really follow the individual drops and evaluate their behavior. We are able thus to describe the transient, that is a time-dependent behavior of such an extraction column. How strong this approach actually is becomes apparent if we look at this case where we actually have changed, just at the start of this video, we just changed the flow rates a little bit as compared to a stable state before. You see now we have a packed column in this case. You see again the drop is rising, the drop size distribution, the so concentration profiles are more or less in steady state already. And uh, in green we see the hold up and actually if you watch at this hold up you see it is steadily increasing, first slowly and then more and more rapidly. And if you look here at the droplets you see that the flow of the dispersed phase stops. And this is exactly what you observe in real extraction columns, this is the so-called flooding. So inherent in this drop-based approach is the ability to describe the flooding and that also with a corresponding accuracy. Based on this simulation tool, we are then able to derive such a design diagram where you see the flow rate of one phase plotted versus the flow rate of the other phase. You get a certain flooding limit, so the limit where both phases don't, are not able to pass past each other anymore in the column. Uh, so states above that are not feasible. And we see, for example, let's just look at the number, number of theoretical stages which characterize the separation efficiency of this 3-meter column for a given material system for which we have be, uh, performed the individual drop experiments, for a sieve tray column with an open area fraction of 39%, for millimeter hole diameters and a pulsation amplitude uh, intensity of 11.7 millimeters per second. And there we see that the number of theoretical stages given in red is highest somewhere in this range. Of course, you want to keep away from the flooding, flooding, flooding limit, so possibly your best option, best operating point would be somewhere around here. So we can see that from this diagram. And you know how much the efficiency decreases if you have to go for process purposes or for process reasons to some other point. 
Of course, we can now vary all the variables that define the separation efficiency of this equipment and are able to adjust this diagram to well, the, your, your, your choices and also in the end, so to speak, to optimize the, the column type. This is one thing for, this, this, uh, for the uh, solvent and reactive extraction, so we can take into account the reactions as well. So we perform experiments, fit our model parameters of dedicated models to these experimental data, then use these models for the systems that we have investigated on lab scale to simulate the extraction equipment on a larger scale. The advantage is it's much faster, it uses much less substance as compared to the conventional approach where you do pilot plant experiments to design your equipment. And it's also easy to change the type of extraction columns, the type of internals, which is usually not possible if you are based your design on pilot plant experiments. There you are stuck with your choice that you made in the beginning and after that if you want to change that you need to redo your pilot plant experiments. So that's a quite a versatile method that we have developed. The second topic we are working on is separation of dispersions. Uh, to give you an impression how that looks like, this is a pilot plant settler with 20 centimeters diameter and some meters in length. The dispersion, the liquid-liquid dispersion, is entering from the left. Typically a wedge like this forms, which is more or less close-packed droplets. In that wedge the majority of the coalescence events occur so that at the end two clear phases are obtained, which then leave the equipment. This settler is equipped with so-called internals. In this case, it's slightly tilted horizontal plates, which enhance the separation efficiency. In order to characterize that behavior, which is of course a very strongly uh, material-dependent property, the coalescence behavior, we have a de de a devised a certain uh, small-scale equipment, which is shown here. Again, lab scale, one liter of system is usually around one liter is sufficient. Again, it has been first designed by Martin Henschke, who was an ingen ingenious uh, PhD student and later did also the habilitation in my group. We have a vessel in which we produce a dispersion with stirrers. They are counter-rotating. This is shown here in the photograph. And for the ordinary simple case, we just switch off the steering and then observe what's going on. We see how the two phases are settling, separating, and evaluate that quantitatively. I'll come to that in just a moment. In case you want to investigate the effect of internals, you can add these internals into a second vessel and can transfer the dispersion that you have produced here uh, with a valve into the second vessel and investigate now the effect of different internals on the separation efficiency. Now how do we evaluate that? Well first of all a principal sketch. We see here this vessel, the standard uh, settling experiment, so at a certain point in time. The droplets, in this case the organic phase has been dispersed in the aqueous phase, so the light phase and the heavy phase, so the droplets are rising. And already a certain region of clear phase, of clear heavy phase has been obtained. Uh, and already a certain number of droplets have collected here, so coalescence is a little bit hindered, but on the other hand side some coalescence occurred because there's already a clear uh, light phase that occurs. And what you can do now is you can observe this line as well as that line, so between the, the, the um, line between the clear phases and the turbulent region or turbid region, you see uh, these lines and you see how they develop as a function of time. And if you evaluate this down here, it characterizes apparently the sedimentation of the drops. So this is the sedimentation curve. This line characterizes the coalescence of the drops. So this is the coalescence curve. And they meet at that point where all the dispersion is gone. So this is the so-called settling time. One can also evaluate this region of closed pack dispersion, but one can usually not observe that in the experiment because this is turbid, the sedimentation zone, as well as the closed pack dispersion. Both of them are turbid, so you can usually not find the distinction between them. So that line only comes from a simulation. We evaluate that behavior again based on drop based models, so individual drop models, and we combine drop models in order to predict then what's going on in this experiment. And this is shown now here for a technical system, a real system, how it really looks like. You see the stirrers stopped already. It's actually a speed up factor of, of five, so it takes some time until something happens. And actually you don't see anything for a certain time. So there's a lag time in the beginning. Again, this diagram, so there's a certain lag time where nothing happens. And actually the first thing that happens is somewhere around here. 
if we wait another second, we realize already, already possibly now there are some lighter region here and some darker region here. So there is some intersection here or some interface here that is slowly moving up. This is very typical for technic technical systems. So there is a primary separation, some turbidity, some small droplets still remaining, and the majority, the big drops, so to speak, already moving up. And after a certain time, we already also see up here the clear phase forming. We can take these data points from this video, can evaluate that, and based on that we are able to predict how a technical settler should be working. For that we can meanwhile even take into account drop size distributions. We were not able to do that before for this very first uh, uh, tool that has been developed. Now we can take that into account. This is shown here. You see actually the polydispersed sedimentation. There's not just a single line, but there's a region, so to speak, a band of the, of the uh, sedimentation curves depending on drop size. You have your closed pack layer of the drops and the coalescence, which also takes into account the varying drop diameters as a function of time and position in this closed pack layer. And with that, we are able to predict what's going on in this uh, settler, also with this polydispersed uh, system. We are even able to take into account a variety of other phases. So in this case, it's dispersed droplets and solids that can have different types of interactions. Here you see the droplets are actually rising, the solids are sinking down. It's, a, for example, a reactive extraction step where simultaneously a crystallization occurs because that's your way of product uh, accumulation, for example, and you can see how the crystals are moving downward, how they are interacting with the droplet phase and all that can be simulated in principle. At the moment we are validating the different underlying models in order to validate then also our simulation result in the end. Based on that experience on phase separation as well as extraction design, we also do uh, solvent selection in cooperation with industry and designing technical applications. One project or one type of project we have been doing actually to applying to several uh, sets of different individual problems was that there was a fermentation in a reactor taking place. So this is a fermenter, well, a bioreactor if you like. Uh, and the goal was to remove the product to avoid pro product inhibition. Possibly in situ but possibly also in a dedicated process and the fermentation medium then being recycled. And the question is, what can you do here before then the final purification? So how to get your product out of the fermentation vessel in the first step? One way to do that is actually reactive extraction, which is shown here. So you see that you see the separation efficiency or the degree of extraction quantitatively as a function of pH. Because here we observe, we investigate the reactive extraction of a cation exchanger with uh, a, a, a di diamino, a hexane with a diamine. Uh, and the idea is now to, uh, to investigate that, and since that is an ion exchange, the equilibrium is pH dependent. And you see that actually the position where the shift occurs from not being extracted to be completely extracted into the organic phase depends here on the concentration of the reactive extractant and so you are able to shift that around and determine your optimum pH to get optimal extraction. But that's only one part of the story. You have to take other effects into account and this is shown on this diagram where I introduce a method that we have been developed. I think many people do it in a similar fashion to design processes but I think we are one of the first who did that very systematically which we call a cascaded option tree. So we have different options physical extraction, reactive extraction, two extractants, different diluents, and for the physical extraction we also have different uh, extraction phases. And we have certain criteria, for example, the toxicity of the components, the extraction equilibrium, and the ease of phase separation. And then we color code how well the different things perform. Green, uh, red means it doesn't work, green means it works, and yellow means it's somehow in between possible but not optimal. And you see that for the toxicity there are already these uh, phthalates which are uh, well harmful to people, so you want to possibly avoid them in your technical process. Then for the equi extraction equilibrium you see there are some things that don't work and you see some others work more or less, but there are some good options that allow you really to perform a good extraction with these um, 
systems and finally we observe the phase separation and there you see that that is the worst case no green case occurred so separation efficient the, the, the phase separation is always a little bit hindered it's not so easy to separate the phases in a fermentation broth but there are some at least relatively good uh, cases available that you want to follow up further in more detailed studies and again you can evaluate the different options on the next level of detail equipment type flow rates whatever that's why it's called cascaded option trees and you also see directly which are the second best options that you have available. Now, why is this phase separation so difficult? Well, because in bio-based processes often something like this happens, so-called crud formation. This is also called interphase, so some intermediate phase between the two phases. In this exceptional case, from industrial sample, aqueous phase is the light, organic phase is the heavy phase, and you have this intermediate phase. And you see how that actually hinders the coalescence, not only in this vessel, but also here in uh, this uh, satellite. You, you see that you, you directly realize you have strongly to strongly reduce the flow rates to be able to perform your separation. So, uh, well, uh, you want to know how that works, how you can avoid that, and how you can influence that, of course. And so we did also some research on that. And the first thing is, of course, the question, what is going on? What's the source of that? And you realize that if you centrifuge your system, you obtain on the one hand side some solid particles and clear phases otherwise. They separate quite easily and if you then add the solids again, you can get this interfaces crud formation. So it's the solids that influence the separation behavior. And actually if you investigate what's going on on the small scale, you see the droplets here of the dispersed, dispersed phase and they are totally covered like an eggshell with the solids. And now it's actually these eggshells that are interaction and no longer the clear phases. This is the so-called Pickering emulsion and of course you know that from home, if I may say so, because you possibly are also producing that at home, your sauce vinaigrette. If you have oil, a salad sauce, oil and vinegar, if you mix them, they will easily separate. What you add is actually some solids, usually some tablespoon of mustard that then stabilizes the emulsion so that you have a nice salad sauce that you can apply to your salad. So that's actually a pickering emulsion and you can evaluate the effect of that again in this uh, lab scale standardized settling cell that, we, that I have mentioned before. You can see that there is some crud layer remaining at the end and you see also that there is an influence of the solids because this was without solids, this is with solids, so also the coalescence in general is slowed, significantly slowed down due to the solids present in the system. And you can even come up with certain ideas of methods to circumvent uh, crud formation. This is done in collaboration with many industry experts who evaluated the different options and they See, well, no option is perfect, so it's a German grading system, so one is best, five is worst. So this is not that good, there's no perfect uh, avoiding method, so you have to try out several of them. One is change the direction of dispersion, change pH, or then deal with the crud by removing uh, the crud layer, withdrawing it in a dedicated uh, level, so to speak, or to have a small input of energy into the crud layer, and so on. This completes the, the second topic I've been talking about, the phase separation. A third topic I would like to focus on is process evaluation. Um, process evaluation we use for a variety of processes and especially for uh, the, uh, how should I say, the early on evaluation of bio-based processes. Because the question that we originally had was, well, we see that the crude oil price is strongly varying. That is, the feedstock for the chemical industry has very strongly varying price, a volatile price. And that means that possibly you want to take into account other feedstock as an option. And the question is, which of the feedstock for which of the products? And of course, bio-based, there are many feedstocks. It can be the sugars, it can be the starch, the plant oil, well, cellulose, lignin, many options, or the entire plant, many options are possible. The question to us was, which is the most feasible, the most pro promising process? And so we wanted to have a very general perspective on that, and we found that actually very general statements can be made based on exergy. Now, exergy is of course haunting all the chemical engineering students, but if I express it in a simple words, it may be not so complicated. 
exergy is that part of energy that you can freely convert into any other form. So it's, so to speak, taking into account the value of the energy that you have somewhere available. And for the chemicals we were regarding, the so chemical streams that we had in processes, we realized that the major contribution is actually the so-called chemical exergy, which describes how much energy is contained in the chemical, in the covalent bonds of the molecules, and how does that change along the reaction from your feedstock to your final product. And if you evaluate that, you get a diagram like that, where the, this major contribution, the chemical exergy, is now plotted ver, uh, for a variety of well, substance classes, fossil feedstock, biomass, intermediates, and some products. And what was striking to us in the beginning, if we plotted that for the first time, we saw that from crude oil to ethylene to polyethylene, which is one of the biggest processes that we have in chemical industry, exergy runs almost horizontally. And the question was, does that have to be so? And we found out, yes, it more or less has to be so. One has to take into account the net uh, change of exergy across the chemical reaction. This is shown here for the case of glucose. If you ferment glucose to ethanol and CO2, and if you evaluate then the weighted average, you get a result like that. So the exergy change across that fermentation step is slightly negative, slightly tilted downward. So it's a process that is easily happening for this overall reaction. So if you combine all reaction products appropriately. So this is an easily ongoing process and on the other hand side we have shown that especially if you want to go in the upward direction you need to pump into that reaction e energy otherwise it doesn't work. Of course you want to avoid that, you want to have cheap uh, reactions, you want to have uh, cheap products which means you should try to also be horizontally. And now since you realize that for example sugars are down here, uh, if you start out with sugars which are readily available you will preferably wind up with products somewhere over here, polylactic acid, PET, or polycarbonate, for example. And there you realize if you compare the different uh, products as well as the different starting materials, you realize that the higher the oxygen content of the molecule, the lower is the exergy value. That is one of the additional insights, so to speak. But it's more or less trivial because water and CO2 have the one of, or are, are pretty low in that level. It's not exactly zero. Uh, but it's very, very low. So these are the final reaction products if you oxidize everything. And of course, they contain lots of oxygen, which means it's the more oxygen, the more you get close already to these final products. This means, as I said, it's preferably these components to be seen in the future, not completely, but there will be a tendency towards these uh, components. As I said, it's the oxygen content that is determining that, and that can be depicted also in some other diagram. This is now a triangular diagram between carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen by weight, expressed by weight for different, well, feedstock, fossil feedstock, coal, crude oil, and natural gas. Then polymer products, the larger the cycle, the larger the production rate. Uh, you see that most of them very well fit with the feedstock for the conventional feedstock and the conventional polymers, but there are some promising candidates, so to speak, already on a pretty large scale, the PET, for example, on a, on a, which is already today produced to a significant extent, which comes close, so to speak, to the red dots, which are the bio-based feedstock, oleic acids, so fatty uh, plant oils, lignin, starch, cellulose, and hemicellulose, and glucose. And we also see here two other bio-based polymers that are prominently discussed for uh, production from bio-based feedstock. So you see what that has to match and it's foreseeable that these big black circles will be moving up a little bit or some other uh, circles up here will appear and will be coming stronger in the future. That will be just a trend, not complete as I said, but it's good to do that, to, go, to move in that direction, to realize that because this means that we have to focus our research on exactly such processes that and the consequences can be foreseen. But that's a separate discussion. I don't want to follow up on that here. Now, exergy is also nice because you can focus on individual process steps, not just the overall perspective that we have done before, but you can really look into the individual processes. And that has been done uh, for all these individual steps from glucose to PET and for, all, for some different variants or different alternative processes from some uh, feedstock 
to a final product and that has been evaluated. That's actually work done by uh, Philip Frenzel uh, and he has designed a tool to do such exergy analysis. Now you see the exergy losses for the entire process from feedstock to uh, the final product. Actually even taking into account the so-called footprint, so what has to be put into the raw material, so biomass has to be produced in the field with fertilizers and everything. Crude oil also needs, needs to be well, distilled, for example, and so on. It also has to be withdrawn from the, extracted from the ground. For that you need energy, that has to be taken into account. And then you can use different feedstock for different products, uh, polyethylene, PET and polylactic acid, and you can compare the different production routes that are available. This is based on today's uh, knowledge based on patents and publications where the corresponding information on pressures and temperatures was available. So from crude oil to polyethylene isn't very efficient, is a very efficient process. You need to, the, the exergy losses are low, that it means you need to put only little energy into the process and it works. For all other bio-based things, uh, processes, you have to put in more energy as compared to this reference case. But you see on the other hand side, starting out with glucose, to produce polylactic acid is a good option and also here you see that PET as compared to crude oil as a starting material doesn't make so much of a difference as well. So there, there starting out from glucose may be not such a bad idea if it is compete, uh, comparable and can compete with a crude oil feedstock. Of course you now need to optimize that in any respect as next steps so to speak. Also, I should say it was a very, uh, uh, should I say, uh, th this exergy simulation was on a relatively broad level. It doesn't take into account the exergy losses of the individual pieces of the equipment. So inefficiencies due to turbulence or things like that have not been taken into account. So that does is just just a order of magnitude sketch, so to speak, gives you some result of that. And you can, but you can apply that on a slightly coarser level again to see how the different uh, raw materials and final products, how they are related with respect to exergy. And here actually only the oxygen content is so to speak regarded. So if you have some glucose and you want to produce a product on glucose level, you have to take into account uh, more or less uh, the, uh, the, feet, uh, the footprint of the material and that's it because the rest more or less is zero. But if you want to go from glucose to fatty acid, so that means you add, um, you, you re re reduce the oxygen content, you have to put in some more energy. There are three different ways how to get rid of the oxygen. If you evaluate them, you see that you have to put in more energy as compared to the direct process. So removing oxygen even from the glucose level to the crude oil level increases the exergy that you have to put into the system. And that way you are able to compare the different options that you have. And apparently, for example, uh, glucose uh, is a good product if you can, can keep the uh, good feedstock, if you want, if you can keep the oxygen in your product. If you want to remove the oxygen, it will cost you energy, it will be more expensive and you can directly see how much more expensive it will become from fatty acid to glucose, glucose level or fatty acid to fatty acid and you already see here actually that if you have start out with fatty acid to wind up as a product on fatty acid oxygen level you need more um, energy for the which is actually due to the footprint as compared to glucose. So glucose is really the optimal raw material if you keep the can, can keep the oxygen in the product. If you need a lower oxy, uh, oxygen content, fatty acids are actually the uh, best uh, starting materials. You can read that from this diagram. Also, it's a private hobby of me. I'm looking at uh, balances on a global level. So where are we going, so to speak? What is the land area use in the future? How does that uh, well, how is that influenced? What do we have to expect for different climate uh, scenarios, for example? If you should be more interested in that, I invite you to, well, if you are on YouTube and see this video, found this video, you can look for those videos on the climate goals, but you can also look at uh, dedicated uh, slides that you have and more explanation on sustainicom.at, uh, where these um, also presentations, presentation material has been collected. Okay, that finishes 
the point on the process evaluation, the next thing I would like to focus on is, so to speak, some leftovers. It's on the one hand side distillation with which we have been working for a certain time and also the fundamentals and the thermodynamics because I've been also active in those fields. Distillation, is, uh, we did some research on distilling uh, aqueous systems in collaboration with industry, directly funded by industry. That's actually why the scale here is not quantitative, it's just some normalized value. Um, as a function of more fraction for two mixtures, let's first regard the methanol water system. It has been investigated in packed column. Actually, Miguel Caraucan was the person doing these experiments and he saw that over a, a wide concentration range, the separation efficiency was more or less as expected. But then as you approach the pure water side, the separation efficiency of this pack column decreases dramatically by a factor of 10 and more. Of course, if you design separations in the pure water region by distillation, you have to take that into account. And for the water morpholine system, where now actually the light boiling component is the water, so this is the water side, you also see that the uh, separation efficiency strongly decreases, not as much as for the methanol system, but also strongly by a factor of two at least, as compared to what you would expect on the water side again. And here for a wide range of concentration, so that you need really to take into account. We designed also models for that and uh, well, it was a separate PhD thesis that worked that out how that can be understood. One can say one of the major influences is actually the high interfacial tension of water, which leads to larger bubbles in the water rich range. So the energy that you would need to produce smaller bubbles is not sufficient in the column, so larger bubbles occur and larger droplets occur, minimizing or decreasing the mass transfer area in the equipment, which of course is detrimental for the overall performance of the separation. Then another topic we have been working on is solids extraction or leaching. In this case, some plant-based material has been used. We again came up with a, a particle um, based description of the process and have designed a standardized equipment to characterize the uh, leaching and extraction kinetics that then leads to uh, such uh, diagrams where you see uh, the experimental data and we, you see that we are able to fit the models. Well, you see the models don't um, uh, deviate so much from the result, but we are able to describe the uh, real experiment quite nicely. Another thing you may have realized from the topics on, on my CV that I'm actually more or less a thermodynamicist by education, more or less. And so I've always been doing also some research on, on thermodynamic modeling. And I think we were one of the first to design models, thermodynamic models, that really take the 3D structure into account really in the interaction. There are others around that forget about the interaction a little bit, but uh, that really takes into account that in the action interaction that, for example, if two molecules can interact at two uh, surface sites simultaneously, that will of course, and if that is attractive, then that will of course enhance the association between the molecules and that will have a pretty strong thermodynamic effect and that can be accounted for by the models that we have derived. Of course, in all of these interactions, all of this research, also industry has been involved. This is just some of the big names, those that are possibly internationally known to a certain extent, so you find their names easily on the internet. Of course, we have a large number of small and medium-sized companies with which we are interacting locally and also in, in a larger area. And I should also say, of course, all of this work that I'm presenting is not done by me personally, but actually is part of the results of my group, which is mostly PhD students. This summarizes the, the expertise on unit operations, solvent and reactive extraction, solids and feature extraction, meaning leaching, separation of dispersion and distillation, fundamentals, thermodynamics, mass transfer interaction of interfaces, which is relevant for the coalescence, and these exergetic evaluations. And the methods that we have is process simulation on the exergy level or, level or also asthma simulations, model-based experimental anal analysis, which is design of experiments so as to minimize the number of experiments needed, which can be quite efficient. These cascaded option trees I have presented, single drop and lab experiments, pilot plant scale experiments, and down to molecular simulations. And there are, of course, more that are in principle available. With that, I would like to finish the short presentation of my research activities of the past. And actually, we are continuing these things. 
taking into account more viscous systems, as I said, drop size distributions, and there are many things that need to be considered if you want to apply that to real systems. For example, also the crud formation is ongoing uh, research. If you should have, well, questions, especially research interests that you want to express for collaborations, please feel free to send me an email. If there are too many emails, I have to select, so to speak, to which I'm answering, but I think it will not be so much, I hope at least. Uh, then, if you would like to know a little bit more details about my research and the research results, please feel free to look at this link where you find all the literature that we have been published in the past, or the links at least in the short description of what has been published in the past. With that, I would like to say thank you, and I would uh, be happy if you would follow one of the other video courses or the video presentations uh, on YouTube on this uh, channel, so to speak. Thank you very much.